Well, this morning we conclude our series on Ruth, Redemption from Bethlehem. And even though we're concluding that little story on redemption, I want you to know, if you don't already, the bigger story of redemption actually continues, and we're at the front end of a season in which we celebrate redemption. And so maybe this is a perfect time of year to look at this little book which helps us understand some of the big themes, the big themes of the Bible and the major theme of the Christmas season. Well, as I said, we're in the last chapter, the last message, and I thought we'd get started today by walking through the first three chapters very briefly. Now, that doesn't mean you can take a nap or check out for the next few minutes, but if you haven't been uh, traveling with us or if you've forgotten a couple of things, let me just remind you of the flow And it's important for you to remember that because Ruth was not written for for people to read it in little tiny installments. It's a story. You know, just like when you have your kids or grandkids and you read them a story, they want to know beginning, middle, and end. Well, that was how Ruth was composed. The authors wanted us to know what the beginning, the middle, and end are all about because they fit together. So we're going to walk through the story quickly, and then we'll jump in and look a little more closely at chapter 4. As we said before, Ruth begins on a real down note. It begins with a famine. And it begins with a famine in Bethlehem. And there's a little play on words there because the word Bethlehem means house of bread. And there's no bread in the house of bread. And then we kind of focus in, you know, we zoom in to this one man and his wife and their two sons. The man's name name is Elimelech. His his wife's name is Naomi, and they have two sons, Malan and Killian. And we're told that Ruth happens in the time of the judges. Now, that was not a real highlight in Israel's history. That was kind of a real low light. In fact, you read at the end of the book of Judges that a summary statement over that whole book and that whole time was, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Let me translate that for you. Don't tell me what to do. That may be okay for you, but don't go push that off on me. Boy, do those themes sound familiar. That was what the time of the judges was like. And of course, God's not pleased with people running their own way, disregarding what he says. And so famine comes to the land. Now, it's kind of a strange situation, especially if you know the names of the parties. So Elimelech means my God is king, and Naomi means pleasant. So my God is king, Mary's pleasant. And they're experiencing life in Bethlehem, and two sons come along. Well, eventually there's a famine, and the, guys who, the guy whose name is my God is king decides rather than stay in the land of promise and blessing, he needs to go to save his life and his family. So he takes pleasant, and he takes his two boys, and they go to Moab. Now, Moab is an immoral, idolatrous place. Moab is kind of like, you know, beyond the pits of where you could go. It's a place where there is food, but not a place where God is honored, not a place where God is worshipped, not a place where any self-respecting Jew who wants to live according to the covenant would go. Elimelech takes his wife and two sons. Here are the names. My God is king takes pleasant, and the two sons' names are sick and dying. So my God is king, takes pleasant, sick, and dying, and they go to Moab in order to save the family, in order to save their lives. Well, as time goes by, Elimelech dies. In fact, there are three funerals in quick succession. Elimelech dies, Malan dies, Killian dies. Isn't that fascinating? My God is king, takes his two sons to Moab to save their lives. But he moves out of God's promise, out of God's story to find life. And he gets to Moab and the three men die. Well, that leaves Naomi and at this point her two daughters-in-law. All right, the two boys, Malan and Killian, each got a wife from Moab. And their names are Orpah and Ruth. Now you've got three widows. But that's a very patriarchal culture. Women couldn't own property. Couldn't, women couldn't have jobs. Women were basically considered second class or worse. And so there are three widows, penniless, jobless. They're in a desperate situation. Naomi hears that God has brought a harvest back in Bethlehem. Maybe there's bread back in the house of bread. 
So she does the same thing like any good mother-in-law would do, right? She says to her two daughters-in-law, go back to your families. Like, I don't have any money. I can't take care of you, right? I don't want you to be a burden to me. You go back. Orpah says, that sounds a good idea. Orpah goes back. Ruth says, I'm not going back. I'm going with you. I'm going to follow you. And here's the important part. And your God. Ruth somehow at the beginning of the chapter has become a believer in the God of Naomi, a believer in the God of Israel. Ruth is now a follower of God. She's a member of the covenant. Well, Naomi figures she can't talk her out of it, so Ruth and Naomi travel back to Bethlehem. They get back to Bethlehem, and boy, could you imagine what that arrival would have been? Um, in fact, we're even told on that return route that uh, when Naomi gets there and the people begin to say, oh, Naomi's back. don't call me Naomi. Remember, pleasant. Call me Mara, bitter. She's a bitter old woman. You ever meet a bitter old woman? Uh, that's what Naomi was, right? And she's technically bitter at life circumstances, bitter at people, but she's ticked off at God. And she's not afraid to say it. God kind of ruined her life. They go to Moab to save their family, to save their lives. They go to Moab, and yeah, they may have found some bread. Elimelech dies, Malin Killian. She's left with nothing. She returns home. She probably doesn't even have property when she returns. That had to be sold in the famine. The return is terrible. But when you come to the end of that first scene, there's a little bit of glimmer of hope. We're told that God has brought about a harvest. And that really brings us to the whole gleaning situation, which we talked about a few weeks ago. And gleaning was kind of like the safety net of the society. And it, you, can go, you can listen to that message a while, you know, if you want sometime. But here's the point. God says to the rich landowners, don't be greedy pigs. And God sends to the poverty stricken, don't be lazy bums, right? Don't be greedy pigs. Don't pick up every kernel of grain from the fields. Only go through it once and let the, left, let the rest there. He says to those that need to eat, go into the fields and work. And that's a hard, dirty job, right? I mean, go into the fields. I mean, it's hot. It's in, you know, it's in the desert area. I mean, they're sweating. They're stinking. Um, Ruth goes to glean, and she collects lots of stuff. And while she's there, she discovers she's gleaning in the field of this rich guy named Boaz. And he becomes one of the central characters. She goes home, and she doesn't know anything about Boaz, right? She's not from Bethlehem. And she says to, well, she takes all this stuff home, and I says, where have you been gleaning today? And uh, Ruth says, oh, I've been gleaning in this guy's field. I think his name was Boaz, some, some funny name, right? Boaz. And then we say, oh, Boaz, he's a relative, he could be a guardian redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. you got to be family, and maybe he could redeem. Now, those two things go together. Here's how the whole kinsman redeemer redemption theme went, which becomes the highlight, one of the big themes of the story. God had worked it out back then that if a family or if an individual got really in debt, um, they would sell their property in order to pay off their debts. But a close relative could redeem, buy the property back, not for himself, but for the family that lost the property. Even if the loss came through stupidity, if the loss came through sickness, a family member could buy back the property, but the property doesn't go to the purchaser, it goes to the person that lost the property. All right, there's another catch in the whole story. If a woman becomes a widow, particularly a young woman, a young woman and there's no, uh, no children, right, no safety net, a closest of kin, typically a brother, could take that widow and have a son from that widow so that her line, the dead husband's line, would continue. Both of those themes are happening. So Naomi says, uh-oh, we probably lost the land, or I need the land bought back, brought, brought, bought back for me. We don't have any males in the family. Maybe Boaz can be the one. And that brings us to the proposal, which Carlos walked us through last week. And how does the proposal go? It's a dangerous situation, right? Naomi comes up with a plan, and on first blush, you may think, oh my goodness, Naomi must not care much for Ruth. Go to the threshing floor. Are you kidding? The threshing floor? Women don't go to the threshing floor. The men meet there. The threshing floor it was kind of like the frat house. 
All right. You know, lots of drinking on the threshing floor. Lots of, you know, women of ill repute go to the threshing floor. Naomi says, Ruth, go to the threshing floor. Well, she goes to the threshing floor and she proposes that Boaz propose. She's not really allowed to propose, but she proposes that he propose. So she basically says, hey, Boaz, I've got a proposal for you. Why don't you propose to me? I'll accept the proposal and then we'll kind of get hitched. Amazingly, Boaz says, I'll do it. I'll do it. But there's a glitch, a big problem. You see, there are lots of rules with this whole kinsman redeemer thing. And it kind of circled down the closest relative had first crack at making the redemption. Well, there's a closer relative than Boaz. So he says, well, Ruth, I'll tell you what, I'm honored that you do this. You know, maybe he's an old guy. Maybe he's gross looking. We don't know. Whatever it is, I'm really honored that you're doing it. But, you know, there's a glitch. There's a closer relative. I got to do it. If he redeems you, good, you'll be redeemed. You and Naomi will be okay. If he doesn't redeem, I'm your man. I'll redeem. And that brings us to chapter four. So if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter four. We're going to kind of read through it, and I'll just tease out a couple points, and we'll wrap this baby up. So chapter four, the whole story is going to come together now. You had to know about famines and funerals and return, and you had to know about proposals, and you had to know all that. And here we come to chapter four of Ruth. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there, just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So we went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative, Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, let me know so that, so that I will redeem it, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. So there's the legalities. I will redeem it, he said. And Boaz said, oh yeah, and by the way, uh, a little Columbo here, right? By the way, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also get Ruth the Moabite, the dead woman's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, oh, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier, earlier times in Israel for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malan's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be, the, and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the, through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The, woman, the women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. 
Perez was the, was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. We get a happy ever after story, right, at the end. Threshing floor to courthouse. Now here's what's going on with the threshing floor to courthouse. The courthouse was the city gate. And so Ruth proposes that he propose, and he says, yes, I'm willing, but we got to follow the details of the law. And so off to the courthouse they go. They go to the city gate. And it just so happens, right, Providence, just so happens that while they're there, the closer relative comes along. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think Boaz knew the relative's name? Of course he knew his name. Small town. Do you think all the elders at the city gate knew the closest relative's name? Of course they did. Do you know his name? No. Because he isn't named. Boy, that becomes a pretty important point here. In fact, uh, you kind of pick it up a little in English where Boaz calls him my friend. It doesn't doesn't really say my friend. Here's what it says. Along came what's-his-face... Uh, No joke, right? Along came what's... Now, here's the point. This guy refuses to step into the story. He refuses the invitation to become part of redemption, to become part of of what God's doing, and he doesn't even get named. He walks away, and the story continues without him. A little reminiscence of Orpah, returns to Moab rather than return with Naomi. Never heard from again. The invitation is given to what's-his-face to step into the redemptive story. He refuses, never heard from again. But at the courthouse, the decision's made. And I, I do want to point this out. Boaz didn't become a man of standing, right? A man who had lots of finances, a man who owned fields, a man who had the wherewithal and the finances to buy Naomi's field. You don't become that way by being a fool. You become that way by being kind of shrewd, right? And, you know, when, 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 I, read that, when I read that section, I always think of what Jesus said. Be as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. You know, if you look at Boaz's life, he's kind of innocent and gracious and generous up till this point, right? He sees this woman from Moab gleaning in his field. He welcomes her because of her, of her character. He says, oh, come and drink the water pots preserved for the men. He gives her extra grain to take home to Naomi. He's reaching out. He's generous. He's gracious. He's loving. And he's also very shrewd. He's some negotiator. Notice how he does the negotiation. He says to Ruth, right, in chapter 3, I will do the proposal, but there's somebody closer. Then the closer of kin, what's his face, comes along. And here's what he says. The first thing he says is, hey, not sure you know this. Naomi's back, and you're the next in line. Do you want to redeem the land? He says, you bet. That's a good investment, right? Particularly because Naomi's old. She's a widow. She's not going to have any kids. Here's how that worked. He would either buy the land back from the the people that Elimelech had to sell it to, or he would buy it from Naomi herself. But anyway, he loses whatever the land costs. But since Naomi's too old to have kids, the purchase remains part of his estate. She's not going to have any kids, right? And so he's not really giving anything up. He's just making an investment, and it's a good investment. The land's probably great. I'll buy the land. Boaz isn't done. He then says that, yeah, now you do recognize when you buy the land, you get Naomi, the bitter old grandmother, right? I was thinking, imagine you're real. I was thinking, Scott Newell, right? I was thinking, him. imagine Scott showing a home to somebody, right? Now look at his home. It's beautiful. Oh, by the way, the bitter old grandmother in the attic, she comes with it, right? (laughs) How many people buy? He He's, he mentions the land, and then he brings up, you get the bitter old hag, too. She stays with the house. <laughs> Lastly, he plays the card. Oh, yeah, by the way, you also get Ruth, the Moabite, the idolater, 
the woman who comes from, notice, we could list a page, and Boaz could have listed a page of her positive qualities. How many positive qualities does he, does he mention at the negotiation? None. Ruth from Moab, period. Well, at that point, what's his face says, uh, I don't want the land. I can't do it. Because now he realizes Ruth's young. If he buys the land, he not only gets Naomi, he now gets Ruth. Ruth can have a son. And if Ruth does have a son, the land doesn't stay with what's-his-face's estate. It goes into Naomi's family line, and Malin's son inherits the property that what's-his-face bought. He says, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. Why would I give up the inheritance for my family? Why would I liquidate my estate? Why would I take something away from my, ki- my children to bring somebody else in? He says no. Boaz then says to all the people, okay, you've all heard it, right? He has declined the invitation to buy the property, get the bitter old woman, and get Ruth the Moabite. You say, I'll take it. And we go from the threshing floor to the courthouse. In quick succession, the scenes change, courthouse to the wedding chapel. And Boaz wastes no time. He marries Ruth. He fulfills the obligation. Notice, this is a costly deal for him, right? Um, I'm not sure what other holdings he had, but if he purchases this land, either from the creditor, or if he purchases it and gives Naomi the asset, that money, if Ruth has a kid, is now out of his family line, and Malin's kid gets, and Malin's descendants get the property. He's willing to sacrifice. I mean, this is a costly deal for him, right? He marries Ruth. And for only the second time in the book, we read that God showed up. God showed up, and Ruth gets pregnant. You may say, well, why is that a big deal? Well, think of it this way. Kids were really important back then, right? You need to have kids because they were going to take care of you. They were like your 401k back then. Right? You needed more kids you had, the bigger your 401k. It wasn't in a bank, it was in your, it was in your kids. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Uh, well, Malin was married to Ruth for 10 years. How many kids did they have? Something's not right. Don't you think in that culture, in that society, they would have tried to have kids? Sure he did. Either Ruth is barren or Malin can't have kids. Ruth is childless in a culture that esteemed and prized having kids. God shows up and Ruth gets pregnant. The first time God showed up was in chapter 1 when we read, and God brought about a harvest and brought bread back to the house of bread. Now God is bringing fertility to a young couple, Boaz and Ruth. We think about the um, the change in Ruth. And I'm kind of glad we're putting the whole book together. It starts out, Ruth comes from Moab. She's an idolater from a country that doesn't know much about God, from an immoral context. Probably she's a worshiper of Chemosh, the god of Moab. She's far from God. Then she's a widow. Then she's an outcast. She's an outsider. She's an immigrant back in Bethlehem. But before the book ends, she's not only accepted, she's not only protected, she's well-fed. She is the wife of Boaz, a man of standing, and she is the mother of a child. What happened to Orpah and what's his face? Yeah, we don't know. They're not in the story. But we know what happens to Naomi, and we know what happens to Ruth, and we know what happened to Boaz, because they accepted the invitation and the opportunity to be in the story, even if it meant some difficulties along the way. So we move from the wedding chapel to the delivery room. You know, kids have changed your life. You know that, right? You have kids. The only way you think kids won't change your life if you don't have any. (laughs) 
I still rem- I still rem- I, I have nightmares. I have, I have dreams about this. Um, you know, being in the delivery room, I passed out once. I'm being in the delivery room with Ashley, first one being born. And so, and, and it's, it's a gross experience, right? For, and, and so they take the baby and they suck stuff out of every orifice you can imagine, right? And they put the, and they, the babies have cheese all over them, it looks like, right? Kind of wrap them in a blanket, put them on this little thing. And so the doctor comes over and hands her to me and he says, hey, she's your daughter. And so, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? He then says, um, okay, Kim's getting kind of cleaned up and worked on here. You come with me. So I put the baby down. I came with him. We get to the end of the hall. He says, where's the baby? I said, well, you didn't say bring her. She's still, in. well, go get her. And I'm walking down. I'm holding her like that. I'm walking down. I'm thinking, this is scared of life out here, right? I, I, I mean, this is frightening stuff. I remember going home and putting her in the bassinet and Kim and I sitting on the bed said, well, what do we do now, Right? Grandkids are different, right? Grandkids make you want to do things you haven't done in years. Grandkids make you want to play dolls and trucks, make you want to go out and jump in mud puddles and go to the playground and build towers and play hide and seek and play no more kisses, like crazy stuff, right? And here's the funny thing. If you have two older, you know, older, I'm one now, right? Older grandparents, my guess is before the grandkids came along, you and your wife never played hide and seek. And you didn't play trucks or go to the playground or jump in mud puddles. All of a sudden, grandkids come, you do crazy stuff, right? And you do it willingly, you you volunteer to do it, you're full of joy. Ruth gets a child. And Naomi gets her first grandchild. Grandparents, isn't it perfectly understandable when the section ends about the delivery room that it says, Naomi has a child because that grandson's sitting on her lap and he's bouncing him around. And this time she has tears, but not the tears of bitterness from chapter one. Now they're tears of joy and celebration in chapter four. God redeems and delivers. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? We go from the chapel to the delivery room. But that's not the end of Ruth. You notice that? Like, like that kind of ends, and there are more verses that come. Yeah, because we don't only go uh, chapel to delivery room. We go from uh, Ruth to David. On the grand scheme of things, just in the context of Ruth, where did Ruth start? In the time of the judges. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes, right? All hell's breaking loose. To the time it ends with the word David's being born. The time when there's peace in the kingdom. When now there's a king. Everybody's not doing what's right in their own eyes. They have a king who's a man after God's own heart, who's calling people back to worship God, calling people to follow him. Now they have a king. And this king, in some ways, is a picture of what God wants to do for us. And David's allowing God to lead through him. And Ruth tells us about David. Did you see the genealogy? Here's the genealogy. If you flip the screen, there it is. Salmon became the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. Who would have thought an idolater from Moab is the great-grandmother of King David. You wouldn't write that. God would write that. Because anybody that acknowledges their need and accepts the invitation to step into his story is welcomed into his story. But that's not the end of Ruth either. Because even though it kind of ends with that genealogy, there's another genealogy where those same exact words show up We started the series by reading it, so I thought we'd read it at the end. Ruth is not only moving to David, Ruth is moving to Jesus. Let me just show you a few select verses from Matthew chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. That'd be good for you this afternoon, right? It'll help you take a nap when you read that long genealogy. Let me just read verse 1, jump to 5, then we'll jump down to the end. Here's Matthew 1 in a nutshell. Matthew begins, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Notice the name. The son of David, son of Abraham. Jesus, David, Abraham. Abraham, the first Jew, but representative of all. David, the ultimate king. Jesus, the son of both. 
Then in verse 5 we read, does this sound familiar now? Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Ruth. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. She shows up twice. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Wow. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Ruth's not only the great-grandmother of David. She's like the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother of Jesus. In his, that's amazing, right? I want to tease out quickly a couple lessons. A couple lessons, because I like to end with lessons, because I'm afraid what you'll do if I don't give you some starting points. Here we go. The first one. God is both sovereign and love. Now, let, let me get at this point this way. Let me ask you a few questions. You need to participate. Wait, wake up if you've been, wait. I'm going to ask you, how many of you have plans for today? Small or great? Raise your hand. Good. You're going to eat lunch, right? Watch the Eagles game take a nap, go for a run. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, you're going to do something. How many of you have plans for this week? Yeah, go to work. Maybe you got a date, go out to dinner, go to school. You have plans, right? How many of you have bigger plans for your life, right? You're working on your 401k. You're saving a little. You're planning vacation, right? I hate it getting cold too. You're planning to go somewhere warm and you got all these plans, all these priorities. And can I just say, hey, God's not interested in your plans. You're not sovereign. God's sovereign. I know it's a cliche. It's pretty true. If you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> Don't you think Elimelech had plans? Don't you think Naomi had plans? Don't you think Ruth and Malan had plans? Don't you think Boaz had plans? Don't you think Orpa had plans? And what's his face? Don't you think they all had plans, right? But God has the best plan. God's not interested in blessing and fulfilling your plan. He's interested in you and me getting in step with his plan. Now, please don't misunderstand me. You know, you may feel like God's absent from you. God doesn't care. Well, there's maybe one of two reasons for that. One, you're not praying and inviting him in. And secondly, maybe you're not looking around and seeing what God's doing. God will answer, and God's inviting you. He's proposing that you become part of the bigger story. Say, look, you know what happens if you don't become part of the story, right? Here's the second one. Good news is always preceded by bad news. We love the joy of how Ruth ends, right? There's a grandson, there's a son, there's a wedding. How did Ruth begin? There's suffering, there's pain, there's famine, there's funerals, there's... Good news is always preceded by bad news. And it's the acknowledgement of our helplessness and hopelessness in the midst of bad news that is part of accepting the invitation that then God works to the good news. Good news always preceded by bad news. Admit that, don't, you know, don't. Try to pretend God knows what's going on, knows what you're feeling. I mean, Naomi's yelling at God. You're ticked off at God. Tell him he can take it. He knows what you're thinking anyway. But when you're open and honest, you, you're in a position to accept the invitation, which leads us to the last lesson. It's identification that brings transformation. A number of points of identification in the book that we've been hinting at all the way through. Orpa identifies with Moab, steps out of the story, never to be heard from again. Ruth accepts the invitation as painful and as it's going to be. In a sense, she gives up her life so that Naomi can have a life. She steps into that redemptive story. And we still preach sermons about her in 2022. Boaz stepped into the story. What's his face? Stepped out of the story. He didn't accept the invitation, and we don't know his name or what happened to him. We know he's not part of the story. Boaz says, yeah, and that meant sacrifice. That meant difficulty. And we preach sermons and learn about Boaz in 2022. And Jesus stepped in to the story of this world, and we celebrate that at Christmas. I've learned a couple definitions this past year. Here, here they are. 
Transparency means letting other people know what's going on inside of you, kind of being open and honest, right? I, I hope you have a few people in your life that you can be transparent with. If not, you need to find, don't do that with everybody, right? Some people screw you, but they, do that with some people. You have a close relationship. But vulnerability is different than transparency. Vulnerability is it inviting someone to journey with you. You know what Christmas is? Jesus saying, uh, your story is my story. Your past is my past. Your penalty is my penalty. My payment is your payment. Now my story is your story. And my inheritance is your inheritance. Christmas means God's not just being transparent. He's been doing that all through the Bible. Christmas is God becoming vulnerable. What are you going to do with that invitation? You've got two examples of those who accept it in Ruth, and two examples of those who reject it. That choice is yours. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for, uh, for this little book. Sometimes we ignore, sometimes it's uh, pushed aside. Sometimes we don't think about its themes. And on kind of the micro level, it shows us that you really are interested in us and you care about us as individuals and families. But Lord, the themes there are the same themes of the whole Bible and the themes that we celebrate at Christmas. Lord, you propose that we step into the story. And if you haven't done that, friend, now would be a great time to do that. And if you have, maybe each day, ask God how to take the next step. Don't step out of the story. Step into it. Yeah, there are twists and turns that you wouldn't choose. But in the end, there's joy and celebration that you cannot imagine. Thanks, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.